Welcome to the second video of our tutorial series Geodata to NVMet. In the last video we looked at Geodata and how to load it into GGIS to reproject them into a Cartesian coordinate system, in, the, in this case UTM zone 18. And in this video we want to go further and add information so that we can actually use this Geodata to create NVMet model areas. So what do I mean by adding more information to using it for NVMet model areas? So if we look at the data that is stored in our um, data sets, we can do so by, for the vector data, we can do so by opening the attribute table. We see that for every building in this case, we're in the building layer, for every building, so every line here has some information. So there's a name, maybe it's not set here. Then there's a bin, whatever this is. There's a construction year for every building. There is information, has it been constructed or not, and, and data that is of use for us and data that is maybe not of use of us directly. For example, um, the feature code is not that important for us and maybe we don't even know what it is, but the height of the roof, this is something that is obviously is important for us, um, for, for us to use uh, when we convert it to an environment model area because the height of the roof determines lots of different, lots of different microclimatic important um, aspects. For example, the shade casting, uh, how much ventilation is possible, yeah, how much inhibits the wind um, to, to, to flow through the model area, etc. So the height of the roof is something that uh, we are interested in uh, exporting to our, uh, to our model. Um, the thing is uh, that if we, we are sort by this uh, column that we see that a couple of uh, buildings do not have a height of the roof. So this is something that we need to take care of. So we should insert this missing data. And also if we sort it the other way, if we sort it descending, we see that there are buildings that have a roof height of 978 0.45 something and this something is not meters obviously because it's not that high buildings in the southern tip of Manhattan it is in feet and NVMet is a metric model so we need to uh, convert this information into meters uh, in order to use it directly in, in NVMet. Also we do not have any information about the walls or the wall materials or the roof materials of the buildings that's not necessarily um, needed for a microclimate simulation depending on what your scope is but uh, obviously it would be nice to have it much more important if we look uh, at the information of the trees uh, there you see we have very little information about the tree geometry yeah so basically we have the diameter at breast height um, again i think this is in inches from the from the data values obviously we can also look at the data source on the website of the open data of new york so there's metadata metadata there the way you can uh, look okay what does it actually mean then there's um, uh, the latin names of the trees so this is information about the species also in the common names and um, so we, we can identify the trees type um, and uh, other information that is not too important for us or that we cannot make a big use all out of uh, because what we would actually need in order to identify which tree NVMet should place in this particular um, spot, uh, we would need to use an NVMet ID. And an NVMet ID is something that most of you are probably familiar with already, but uh, I want to talk about it briefly in order for those uh, who, are, who have no understanding of it as of yet. So NVMet for its model area files uses gridded data. So every cell here holds information. It can hold information about a building, uh, about simple vegetation that you see here, about trees, about surface types, etc. And all of these grids, um, they have need to have more information obviously than just is there a grass here? But what type of grass? How high is the grass? What's the albedo of the grass? What, how deep are the roots? Uh, for the buildings, what is the species, how big is the crown, where does the crown start, where does it end, uh, what's the width of the ground, what is the albedo of the leaves, how many leaves are there uh, per, per volume. Yeah? So what NVMet actually does is it stores, instead of all this information in the cell, it stores an ID, a database ID. And these database IDs, they carry these informations that are needed for the simulation. So they carry the information about the physical properties of the, like I said, the albedo, the emissivity, stuff like that. 
and these data uh, items are identified by your unique IDs. Yeah, and you can think of an ID as a string of six characters, and this links to the database, and uh, it is then organized in a system database that Envimat comes with. So, with so if you install Envimat, you have a system database that has a vari uh, large variety of different tree species, wall materials, uh, roof materials, uh, greening items, facade and roof greenings. Uh, soil profiles and so on, and you can also um, create your own soil profiles, materials, etc. So what we need to do now is basically link this information. So here, this these features, yeah. So uh, yeah, here, for example, every line of these um, is a building or whatever, yeah. And we need to add the information of what is the uh, database ID. So, what is the properties of the? In this case, it, it is um, soil profiles uh, of this soil. Yeah, uh, which database ID links to this line? So, we need to add a column, basically a column called, for example, Envimat ID or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, or ID, microclimate ID, or something. And we need to add this information for all the features individually in order to differentiate between, for example, that this cell here would be a loamy soil, the next one would be uh, asphalt, the next one would be concrete, and so on and so forth. So these database IDs, mm -hmm. they hold all the information, the physical properties. And in order to link them to the objects in your GIS, you need to give uh, each line the information of a database ID. OK, so how do we do it? So for the um, raster, uh, sorry, for the vector information, we have exactly these tables, yeah? these tables where we can just simply add another field and then based on the values that we have, we can uh, write a couple of lines of code or we can hand them, or we can uh, insert the data manually. Um, that, for example, this American uh, Elm uh, should be uh, the database ID 050012 or something. Yeah, So uh, we can simply um, add this information uh, by hand or um, also use a, a code that we'll discuss in a second in the, in the attribute table. The same goes for the attribute table in the buildings, obviously. But what about the, the information in the, uh, in the raster data? So the raster data, it has information about uh, which land cover it is in the in these numbers and for that the Envimat uh, plugin also features the possibility to uh, import information from a raster layer using a define values attribute so let's do uh, one after the other and start um, with the uh, the buildings yeah so we start with the buildings and first and foremost, uh, the building height obviously is the most important one. Yeah. So uh, what we do is we start editing while we have the attribute table open. And we say, OK, open the field calculator. And we want to create a new field, so basically a new column. And we want to call it uh, B height. Yeah. And so building height, basically. And maybe we also in meters, yeah, so that we know this is the one in meters. And the output field is of the data type um, decimal, yeah. So uh, it's a uh, yeah, it's a floating number. Um, and uh, so we want to do the following: we want to, based on the value that is stored in height roof, we want to calculate the new one in meters. And we can do so by clicking on fields. Oh, fields, yeah. So we want to have the height roof. Times zero point um, three zero four eight. So this is basically to calculate from feet to meters. Yeah. So every uh, point three four eight uh, feet is one. Um, no. The, so three feet are basically one meter. So uh, I can divide by by uh, three or multiply by zero point three roughly. And you see the preview that uh, for one cell, for example, it would be 17.62 would be the resulting height. And if I click OK, then we have this, uh, we have this um, column created. 
and you see that these are more reasonable numbers, so 289, so almost 300 meters. And if I click on it, on the, on the one here, I see which building it is. Yeah, this would be, um, this particular building uh, would be the one with 200, uh, what was it, 98 meters, yeah. This one would be the second highest because I ordered by, by height in this case, yeah. And then there's also buildings that do not feature a height. And for those, yeah, uh, where are they? The, these buildings that are now highlighted, yeah. Mm, let's de-click this. So these ones that are yellow, uh, highlighted in yellow, they do not feature a height. So what I can do now is maybe go on Google Street View or something and count the number of um, uh, of, of windows and multiply them by the default height of a, of a story or something uh, to get this information. So um, this would be one option or maybe uh, yeah, get other data sources of the building heights. So this could be one option. Um, in our sample case here, I, I simply uh, yeah, set the building height to maybe three meters because yeah, this is just a showcase. Um, and then you can also see how this is done. So open the field calculator again. We want to update uh, these 17 uh, fields, these 17, uh, these 17 features, these 17 buildings. And we want to update a f existing field, building height, and it should get the number three, so three meters. This is just a very crude, um, very crude uh, yeah, way to do it. Um, obviously, if yeah, this is your model area you want to create a microclimate simulation in, then you would uh, yeah, research uh, the buildings. Maybe they are not constructed uh, yet or something. There's maybe some reason that they are not in there. Uh, but then you can also, like I said, check Google, check uh, um, yeah, aerial views, etc., in order to obtain this data. So we can save this information. And now um, we have the building height in meters. Um, when we look into the plugin, we can also always check, okay, which information is needed as well. So, or can we enter as well? So for example, the building height, the building top can now be uh, selected because we already calculated the building height in meters. Yeah? If we didn't have this data for some reason, yeah, and there was no way to getting it, we could also use a static value. So if we select this uh, checkbox, then all the buildings would have the height of 15 meters. Yeah, But this is a very crude assumption. So in most cases, you should be able to at least get some idea of how high the buildings are, and then are, you are able to select it here. So you can also have the building start not from zero, but from, uh, yeah, from a different height. So they can start at five meters. So for example, if you think of a, a courtyard and there's an entry to the courtyard then obviously in there no car or people can go through if it starts at zero so maybe it starts at five meters or something uh, so there could be a field that is for most of the buildings most likely zero because they start at ground level and but maybe for a, yeah for a big opening in the building uh, you can have a building bottom other than zero building name could also be an option to set it because you want to identify or some of the buildings iconic ones do have a name you can have a um, so you can also um, have the name here attributed, but most of the time, especially in this data set, the name is empty. Yeah, So it doesn't really make sense to, to use it and we're not using it further. What is interesting is of course adding a field for the building walls. So we can all add the building walls for specific buildings. For example, we are going to um, run a simulation um, in this area here so we want to have the park here and a couple of buildings here so it might make sense to add information about the building walls so maybe this is a brick building this is the glass building uh, of the wall material to add further information of the buildings that are really close to the area that i want to simulate and i can do so by adding another um, column so going to the field calculator calculator uh, create a new field and uh, give it a name, for example, um, wall ID, yeah, and this would be the output field type would be string because it's a string of characters, it's six characters. And um, when I define it in the first place, I can give it already some kind of value and I do it with, uh, with this, um, uh, with this uh, single apostrophe and I give it, for example, the value of um, a default concrete and 
in order to obtain this uh, information about which uh, database IDs are available, I can either go into uh, the Android headquarter and head into the DB manager and open the DB manager and then take a look at the wall IDs that are available. So once it's loaded, um, I go to the uh, wall and roof constructions and I take a look into um, yeah, what is available here. So for example, a default wall with moderate insulation would have the ID of 0200MI or um, no, maybe a, a simple metal or maybe stone. Yeah, brick wall would be 0200B1. Yeah, so I can uh, use these IDs, yeah, these database IDs, and set them first for all the buildings, and then uh, highlight individual buildings and and yeah, give them different ones. Yeah, so this would be uh, one option. The other option to obtain these data information about these database IDs is. Um, if you have Enumet installed on your PC, to go into the uh, plugin. No, wait, I have to cancel this. To go into the plugin, into the database lookup. And uh, the database lookup, you select your project. And then you see here which database items are available. You, here you see again 0200MI is a default wall with moderate insulation. Yeah? Uh, for surfaces, these database IDs are uh, available for sources and pollutants these, and for simple plants, and so on, yeah? So there are different ways of obtaining these database IDs. This is the database ID, for example, of a TDR core, uh, core data example, and uh, yeah, of very lots and lots of different trees, yeah? Okay, so um, we do that for the for the buildings now. So um, open, oh, sorry, open the field calculator, and create a new field, wall ID, and I pre-fill it uh, with 0200MI, uh, the moderate insulation. So all the buildings now become uh, get the default value of the moderate insulated wall. So I check here, that's correct. And maybe I want to alter uh, individual buildings. So for example, I, when I select um, this building, I know that this building was a for example, a, a glass uh, f had a glass facade. Then I look up what is the glass facade. So typically, it's a heat protection glass. 0200G1 would be the database ID. Um, so while this is selected, yeah, I uh, move the selection up. This is the button to move the selection to the top, and I can simply double click here and uh, give it what was it? 00G1, I think. Yeah. So this would be then now have a glass uh, wall. Yeah? So the walls would, would be made out of glass. I could save it. And uh, now this information is stored in the attribute table. So when I go back to the layer here, I could say, OK, the wall IDs are stored here. And I do not want to use the static value instead, but I want to use the specific value I entered for all the different buildings. The same goes if I want to do for roofs or for greenings, for wall greenings or rooftop greenings, and maybe I want to have individual buildings set for a building performance simulation output, then I would set it uh, to one. If I wanted to have for this particular building, I want to have a more uh, detailed output in the um, coming from the Endromat simulation, then I would uh, enter a one here or a zero if I didn't want to have this. Yeah. Okay, so the buildings are basically set. So we have the information about the height, and we have the information about individual wall IDs, and uh, that we already set them here correctly. Um, you see that by the checked uh, mark here in the summary. So what about, uh, let's go further with the other vector data, and that would be the vegetation. Yeah? The vegetation, especially the simple plants. Yeah? Oh, sorry, the 3D plants, the trees. So if I look at the trees, in the attribute table, um, you see that there's lots of information there, but um, there's not so much information uh, about the the building uh, about the tree height. Yeah, there's the tree uh, diameter at breast height. Okay, but there is uh, the most the best um, information is basically the, the the species information here, I think, and for that. Um, the, the basic, the basically the tree, the, the species information here. And for that, I can um, also utilize this information to create the Envimet ID. The Envimet ID for trees is not stored in the DB manager. You can, again, either use the plugin, yeah, the plugin and the 
database lookup here for the 3D trees, or you can use the Albero and go into um, uh, head over there and then take a look at the different trees that are available in the system database, or maybe you want to add a different tree, you can, you can uh, feel free to do so. So for example, I can head into the Elm. So there's the Dutch Elm and the Dutch Elm uh, is 12.22 uh, meters high and the width is five uh, by meters in the one direction and five uh, meters also in the other direction. And it holds the idea of zero to one Oh no, zero two zero one two one. Yeah, so this would be the database ID of this particular tree. And what you can do now is um, use the field calculator again to fill this information in a new column. So go to the field calculator. You want to create a new field and use the maybe NV ID. Let's call it NV ID. Yeah, again it is a string. Yeah, the data type is string. And now instead of giving it all the same tree, I can uh, use the a case of, a case of a conditional. Uh, so I can uh, link the information of another field to uh, use uh, this information of, for example, if the name uh, contains elm or honey locust, then uh, I will give it uh, the ID of a, of a honey locust. Yeah. So, for example, when condition first, yeah, when the field uh, common, and here I use the like, yeah, like, because I don't want, I do not want to ex express it exactly like this. Yeah, like would be a uh, yeah more fuzzy logic. Uh, when it is like oak, then put this zero to zero. 440 yeah then put this uh, database id in, into the new column yeah this would represent an oak i looked it up before here yeah um or when uh, and then the second one oh and then the the second one would be when it is like maple then uh, it would be uh, 020020 zero zero yeah so this is a, a maple tree in our database yeah and you can do this for uh, all the different common species, yeah. And you can also uh, give it an else for all the ones you do not define. They will get, uh, for example, a yeah, medium-sized tree of zero uh, one zero four four zero, yeah. So this way, you can easily, um, yeah, give give all these different uh, features, all these different trees, database IDs of EnvyMed. Yeah, this is uh, one way to do it. Okay, so I entered the 10 different trees here, uh, tree, uh, uh, tree species here, and added them in, in, as the NVID ID, and I, I saved the, the progress. And uh, yeah, to check uh, how they are distributed, um, you see that these data points are here, and let's, let's color them by the different NVMED IDs. I can do, the, do so by uh, doing the, selecting the symbology as categorized, and oh, classify by a value, by the uh, NVID value, do so, and now you see that the different colors uh, indicate different tree species. Yeah, this would be based on the tree species in the common name. I, I use their resemblance in our database, and um, yeah, this results in in these configurations. Yeah, what you also see here um, that the Battery Park doesn't feature any trees. Yeah, so this might often be the case when you download Open Data or something. Yeah that the data sets are not necessarily complete. Yeah? So obviously um, you need to have, or you, you should uh, have this information about the trees here. And what you can do here uh, now easily in the in, in GIS is adding a, uh, a base layer, adding a, for example, Google satellite uh, information. And then you, you see that there are trees, but there's no points. For example, here you see the, the these points are here and resemble the trees. But inside the park, there are no trees, even though there obviously are trees there. So uh, what you can do then is just simply add the trees yourself. Yeah. So go to the trees, edit the uh, toggle the editing, and uh, say okay, I want to add point features, and uh, yeah, click them. And what I always do is I first uh, I look at the which trees are 
the same, most likely the same species. Obviously, you can use Google Street View or something um, to gain more information about it. But in most cases, when you're interested in, um, not in, in tree health, the tree geom geometry is much more, um, uh, much more important than the actual tree species. Then I um, look at the trees that look the same height here, yeah, and I uh, digitize them uh, first. Yeah, and then I uh, these are look all the same height. Maybe these are also the same height, and then I select them. And inside the attribute table, I go again into the open field calculator and I say update the 26 selected features, update the existing field, and give the, all of them the same ID. Yeah, for example, this one of a 10 meter high or 12 meter high uh, tree. Um, this would be uh, an oak tree. Yeah. Okay. So now I did this, and now they also carry the information about them. Yeah. So um, I will, I'll be doing this um, and adding these, these trees here. Um, and there's also, you could also yeah, digitize first all of the points and then uh, yeah, select which ones are which. But I think the, the quickest way is, is doing like this first, all the trees that are uh, similar and then giving them an ID by selecting them and then doing the same uh, for, the, for the next trees that are similar. For example, these are quite high trees here. Yeah. Maybe this one is also a very tall tree and uh, then selecting these and, and, and doing them uh, together in bulk. Okay, I've done that now. So I added all the trees. Obviously the same goes for buildings. Uh, often uh, you want to compare two scenarios. Uh, maybe um, a new building has been built or planned and you want to see the impact. So first you simulate the status quo and then the second scenario you add the building or you need to alter buildings or something like that. So then you can always use also the, digitaliz the digitalization um, function. So adding a building, for example, um, yeah, I could add a, a building here um, and then uh, give it all the information again in the attribute table. Yeah, give it a height, give it a different uh, building um, wall material. So um, select the building I just edited, and this would be the building. And then I enter the the building height here and the wall material there. Yeah. So um, this this is obviously um, a possibility in the buildings uh, the same way as it is in the. In the trees, yeah. Okay. So now that we have entered the NVIDs for the trees, uh, we can go into our plugin. And uh, yeah, since we already entered the information for the building, we can go to the trees, 3D plants, and say, okay, the trees are stored in this layer. And the uh, selected uh, field is NVID. Again, we could also say, okay, all the trees are the same species. Then we can use uh, this uh, method and define the, the NVID ID here. But uh, yeah, since we uh, did the effort and then uh, yeah, categorized them based on their species, um, let's use the animate ID. Uh, here is the same thing again. You can also have individual outputs, additional outputs for the tree health of specific trees. For example, you want to know, okay, a tree at this location, is it, uh, how hot does the leaves get? Uh, does it have enough water access, et cetera? Then you would add another column. Uh, zero for all the trees that you do not want to have an additional information of and one for all the uh, trees that you want to have an additional information of and select the column here. Okay, and now let's come to the um, to the surfaces and simple plants. Like I said, the our surfaces, if they were in vector format, it would be basically the same again. Yeah, it would be uh, each of the different attribute tables, the different lines would have to have the information about the NVMIT ID or I could use the all the same, um, so this would be a pavement for all the same uh, for all the um, for all the vector information. But uh, since we are using the raster uh, raster as an input here, um, we can or we should use the surface as raster layer. Um, and here it's a bit different because uh, here we can uh, use the define values uh, function. So we first select which raster uh, is the one that carries the information. This would be LC for land cover. Um, UTM, uh, area of interest, and then uh, we define the values. So for example, ours goes from one to seven. Yeah, So uh, one equals an NVMIT ID, two equals an NVMIT ID, three equals an NVMIT ID, 
and so on. Yeah, so we do that, um, and then we need to think: okay, which one is which? Um, and we, here we still have the information about uh, the uh, about the different land cover information from the the, the data uh, from uh, the website from from last video. So one equals tree canopy, two grass and uh, shrubs, three bare soil, four water, five buildings, six roads, and seven other paved surfaces. And a uh, quick look up in uh, the DB Manager shows that natural surfaces could be, for example, a default sandy loam or um, uh, yeah, or the, the, this uh, default unsealed soil, and then a street might be uh, this street, yeah, and water would be maybe www and so on, and for that uh, we can define uh, these defined values like this, and the other, and this is important because if we look at the data where there is no data available, yeah, there is no pixel value. This is water because uh, the data that we downloaded from from the website um, had. Uh, only information for the land, but not for water, maybe for specific peers, but not for the water itself. So in our case, and this might not always be the case, uh, other becomes the value of uh, water. Yeah? Typically, other uh, has a different value, not water, but maybe a, a sealed soil or something, yeah? of um, a pavement or something, but in this case it is, it is water. Um, we can also save this definition if we're using uh, this data more often and load it again. Um, but since we're only using this once, uh, we do not need to save it. The one thing that is now still uh, open for a classic uh, microclimate simulation would be uh, the simple plants. And the simple plants can be deduced from the, uh, from the surface layer, more, most, in most cases at least. Because the surface basically provides the information uh, about can lower plants grow there yeah because on the um, on the asphalt and on the on the paved uh, areas and where the, the buildings are there's obviously no grass growing but where there's um, where there's open soil there's often grass growing and this is the case here too so in um, the case of one there is grass and this is called xx in our in our model the standard grass so simple plants grass yeah so XX would be 25 centimeter high grass, so this is uh, quite common, I think. And two would be the tree canopies, so underneath the trees we also plant the grass. And here uh, the other would be, you should delete it in this case, because for, the all, for all the other pixels there should be no vegetation, simple plant vegetation. Again, we get it which layer holds this information. This would be the land cover uh, layer. and um, yeah, we should be we should be finished here. So now we check. So we have the gridding set, we have the surface, uh, the building set, we have the surfaces set, we have the simple plants and the three D plant set for a classical thermal comfort simulation. This is uh, exactly what we need. And uh, what we also need, of obviously, is a building, uh, is a is a model area. So this is just the area of interest. Obviously, we could uh, simulate this whole area now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's quite a large area and we want to have a more detailed uh, simulation. So um, let's uh, yeah, make another uh, smaller box, bounding box for the actual model area. And um, here the plugin expects a, um, a, a layer, a vector layer containing only one rectangular polygon. Yeah? So we can do that by creating a new uh, vector layer and let's call it maybe sub area yeah sub area area uh, utm and this would be sub area 1 and it is a polygon like i said a polygon feature and it should be in the same uh, coordinates reference system that would be 18n and it doesn't need to have any information in the attribute table, but just needs to be one um, uh, uh, one uh, polygon uh, rectangular uh, shaped. And to visualize the outlines better, we just uh, want to have it uh, transparent and just the outlines uh, we want to have drawn. Okay, um, so we draw that and here again comes, um, 
here comes this in very much in handy to use the rectangular feature uh, so that the polygon uh, that you digitize is actually um, a rectangle. So um, using this function, rectangle from three points projected, um, you can also um, ensure that the orientation is the, the way that uh, animate works. So because the first baseline you draw, this baseline, um, this is the one uh, where you define the uh, lower edge of the model. So this would be, this here would be the lower edge of the model when you run the model simulation. And this uh, second uh, thing where you ex ex extrude the or expand the um, the rectangle would be the y dimension. Yeah, um, you can also ro rotate it obviously because this is also not, not really um, rectangular, uh, not really um, oriented to north uh, directly. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, just make it like this maybe. I can also alter it always. Yeah, I can select it again and then. Uh, yeah, move move it yeah or um, rotate it uh, any way you like and always this line here the f one you draw drew first using this model you can also uh, using this uh, helper um, uh, function um, will be the the baseline in the model area so this would be down let's say yeah this would be the the lower edge of the model this would be the upper edge of the model yeah horizontally speaking that that is okay so this might be our model area yeah let's uh, again save this and we can uh, in the plugin say okay let's use the sub area one for our um, actual climate simulation and then you see here it directly um, calculates okay how high is the highest building plus maybe a terrain there is no terrain in the model um, and also how many grids um, will how large will be will the model be so it's 605 meters in x dimension and 531 in y and if we grid it by three by three meters then this would, re would result in 200 by uh, 180 grid cells um, and this is a typical model area size. So typical model area sizes are 150 by 150 up to maybe 350 by 350. Um, obviously, you can use all the different uh, yeah, numbers of grid size, uh, grid cells, uh, but uh, the typical values are between 150 in both di dimensions up to maybe 300 or 350. Um, obviously, the more grid cells uh, the model is comprised of, uh, the longer the simulation takes. So uh, let's say, okay, I want to have a resolution of uh, 3 by 3 meters horizontally, and in vertical dimensions, um, the highest building is 200 meters, and roughly uh, you should have twice as the, the, the model area should be twice as high as the highest building, but below uh, 2,500 meters should be the model uh, height because of the average height of the uh, boundary layer. So um, this is fine. Yeah. So we could also alter it. Yeah. We could uh, run it with a little bit less uh, Z cells. Yeah. Only maybe 28 Z cells would be enough. Yeah. Because the highest building is 200 meters, and the m resulting model height is 832 uh, or 30, 31. So um, uh, this is enough. Yeah. So let's leave it like this and also I want to show you the additional gridding settings because this uh, is also quite interesting I think or can, can, can uh, come quite in handy. So if you didn't define a roof or wall material um, you could uh, yeah, define it here again for the, for the uh, buildings and, and walls. Uh, here uh, you have the option uh, to clear the model border and this is something that is important. So, for example, here you see the model border is actually going through these buildings, yeah? And Envimet uh, needs to have uh, some kind of space between the model border and the, the adjacent buildings because of the wind flow coming in or going out of the model needs to be clear. Um, obviously, you could alter these buildings, but it's much easier to just say, okay, clear the, the model border uh, close or clear, clear the building cells close to the model border for five grids. So this would be 15 meters in our case because X and Y is three meters, three times five is 15 meters. And um, here the model border should be roughly um, clear of the, 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 yeah, the, w the width that should be clear and the model border should be roughly uh, twice, no, 
And here the, the model border should be roughly um, clear half of the height of the adjacent building. So if this, this building is 20 meters high, it, the model should be clear at least 10 meters. Yeah? So um, this is an option that's default on set uh, to on. And um, yeah, I would always suggest leaving it uh, to on and just uh, adjusting the number of grid cells according to the height of the buildings that are close to the model border. Then uh, the next one would be to uh, level buildings uh, that are with, uh, inside the terrain. We do not have a terrain here, but in case you have a very steep model area and buildings are in, uh, on the hill, placed on the hill, then their roofs are typically, um, they should be straight, yeah, horizontal, but, um, uh, and, and this ensures it, yeah? If in case you un uncheck this, then the uh, height of the roof will follow the terrain, yeah? In case you do want this, you uncheck this box. Then the gra start gridding surface. So for example, if you um using vector data and not all the area is covered for the surface, uh, but you left some of them uh, left some of it out, you can define uh, what should be in the places where no um no uh, data is is defined. And the last one is remove vegetation or simple plants trees from buildings. This might be the case somewhere, for example, uh, where there's a tree very close to a building due to the gridding algorithm. For example, here, yeah, if we grid in a very coarse resolution, let's say 10 meters or, or 7 meters, then this uh, tree might be, uh, due to the gridding, result uh, to be located on top of the building. But this is obviously not realistic. So, um, you can uh, remove the building or simple plants that would result in being on top of the building uh, with this checkbox. Okay, now we have all the um, essential uh, sections uh, selected for uh, yeah, running a typical climate simulation. And um, yeah, we can define the output file and we do that in the basic, uh, in the, the root folder of the project and name it uh, NYC Battery, yeah, Battery Park, or close to Battery Park it is, and um, click on Save INX file, and it will convert the data. Okay, now that it is at 100%, uh, we could also look at the model in spaces and see uh, the outcome and then check if everything went the way we, we wanted it to. So we select the, the project folder and we open the uh, INX file. It loads the file and looking at the buildings, it looks, looks good. Looking at the soil and surfaces, yeah, looks fine too. And if we look at it in 3D, we can also check if the building heights look uh, reasonable and also if the trees are placed in the in the correct uh, locations. Okay, in 3D. So we look at the model area. So we define this building to be made out of uh, glass. So the, the facades are glass facades. The other ones are all the same material. And we see that the, the vegetation has been placed. We see that the, uh, the Hudson River um, is also there. And uh, yeah, we can look at the model three-dimensional. And yeah, this is based only on the, on the geodata and the data we added. So here you can directly see again that the linking has, has, has worked. So there's no unidentified, um, unidentified surfaces, which would be indicated in red. And also the trees are not missing, which would also be indicated in red in the, in the th 2D view. Yeah, so all the linking worked out fine, exactly as we intended it to. Okay, this should be it for the second part of the tutorial. We covered a lot of things. First, we took a look um, at how to link geodata to the Envoy database items. Uh, we filled the necessary data for vector data and uh, for, the, for the simple puns and surfaces, we used the define values function. We also took a look for the, um, we also took a look into the attribute table for the buildings and the trees and uh, used some field calcula calculator operations to fill the data necessary. We also added a sub area, so basically the area that should be simulated and configured it based on the um, properties of the 
dimensions for x and y, so the resolution, but also the area, the total area dimension, and also looked at the additional gridding settings. Um, finally, we extracted the model and took a look at it in 3D and spaces. So in the next video, what we want to do is we want to create a simulation file, the configuration of the simulation, so add the meteorology, add the date, add the simulation duration, etc., and actually run the model to be then able to look at the results, add them to the map, create a nice visualization of the simulation results. Thank you for watching and see you next time.